Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows, where I am making critical connections for a post-authoritarian and anti-authoritarian world. It is now my great pleasure to welcome Mursal Sayas, who is a writer, feminist, and activist from Afghanistan. She worked for the Independent Human Rights Commission in Afghanistan and left soon after the Taliban regained power in 2021, uh, after which she settled in France. Marcel Sayas recently published her first book titled Qui entendre no cri? This is in French, translated as Who Will Hear Our Cries? Ten Testimonies from the Women of Afghanistan, documenting the lives of ten women who have suffered terrible, terrible hardships at the hands of a rigidly patriarchal culture. So first of all, thanks so much for joining us today, for joining me today. And um, could you explain how and why you came to collect the testimonies for your recent book? And why did you decide to publish this book? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Well, uh, the book Qui entendra nos cris is um, a collection of uh, 10 stories of the victim of uh, domestic violence in Afghanistan. I collected the stories while I was working with Afghanistan Human Rights Com Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission since 2017 and the day I left Afghanistan. I met those women in shelters, prisons, hospitals, and other places that their rights might be violent, uh, violated in Afghanistan. And also they were coming to Human Rights Commission for seeking AIDS and to receive help and support from us um, while we were working with the Human Rights Commission. That's how I uh, collected the stories, but how and why I thought about publishing this book uh, while I left Afghanistan, I brought nothing with myself, just my computer and a hard disk. So that was uh, when I arrived here, I was I had always this feeling of being guilty for leaving Afghanistan behind, for leaving those women behind. And also I was thinking to do something for them. And there was the thing that occurred in my mind. And I thought, OK, this is the opportunity and this is what I can do. Now I'm alone here. Now I left everyone behind, my family, my children, my life, my nostalgia, everything behind. But how can I survive? Well, I could survive with doing something back for the country. I did, so this is why I decided to write this book. Um, yeah. Wow, that's really amazing. That's really amazing. Um, could you explain why you went to France and... Um, also, will there be an English translation of the book? Uh, well, for being France, there isn't any specific reason. That was the first option I had. Uh, well, the Afghanistan when the Afghanistan collapsed, and we we were so confused what to do, what will come next, and all of us, my colleagues, the other human rights defenders, the journalists, everyone was so concerned about. What will happen? What can we do? All of us, we were waiting for uh, the Taliban to knock our doors and come inside and, uh, and try to investigate. And there was a very um, horrible situation. So, um, but the, um, our office, Human Rights Commission, they made a list of all the colleagues and they sent to different embassies, different countries. Um, and France came first. So I came to France uh, right two or three days after the Taliban. Um, there was a reason uh, for the translation of the book. I would love to translate it in English because there is a lot of audience who is asking every day for the English translation and they are uh, interested into the book and they want to read it as soon as possible. Um, the book has been published on January 17th of January 2024, which is quite new. Uh, yeah. So we didn't negotiate with any other publisher yet or um, the English publishers, they didn't come to us, at least for now. So we are looking forward to translating this into English as soon as we can. And also in Farsi, our own language uh, sure. for the Afghanistan uh, audiences. Right, that's great. Please, can you explain your journey as a female activist and writer over the years? When did you first identify as a writer and when did you first identify as an activist? Mm -hmm. um, well, it's quite a journey. I, 
I sacrificed everything for this, for being a human rights activist, not a human rights activist to, first of all, to work with Human Rights Commission, because um, I'm coming from a family, it's a uh, very religious and well I cannot say my for example my parents or my um, father from my father's side they were not that much restricted but but still we had a lot of limitations for us as women as daughters as wife and as not as a woman not as a human so I studied Islamic law and then I um, before that I was working with uh, Noor TV which is a um, TV network in Afghanistan I was a news presenter in Farsi language so uh, but uh, during it was during my education when I, I got engaged my ex um, husband he didn't want me to want me to work with this TV because he didn't want me to be seen by the people and uh, like that I quit my job and I continue my studies as um, in, in law so I finished my school or my university and then I uh, after one year when I was a mother during my studies, I I was um, still I was uh, studying uh, at the university and I had my first child and then I was graduated and after one year and a half and I find this job at Human Rights Commission. So uh, my ex-husband, he didn't want me to work there, um, obviously, and I struggled a lot for that work. And today I was talking with a friend, uh, which was funny. And well, by the time we forgot how we struggle for having things or for doing things. For this job, I was not allowed to do. I was not allowed to go to the area. I was not allowed to travel. I was not allowed to I was just allowed to go to the office on time and get, come back home on time and to have my children first of my child with me first of all and then I had another child also my my office was so supportive they knew how hard I am working but still there was some competitions and people didn't want to me be there as well I was feeling this double pressure inside the family and also at the office I couldn't tell to my colleagues I'm not allowed to go to the places that uh, the things are happening okay. or the cases are happening or I'm I cannot travel because I was so ashamed of that oh. as a free woman as an independent woman I'm not allowed to do this or mm. my ex-husband he's he doesn't let me it was so against my mm, dignity and I couldn't explain this so but there was also pressure on me from the office no you have to go you have to do this so I struggled a lot with this uh, for the years and um, well, I worked with all those difficulties and I had my second child, my daughter uh, on that time. I was 21 years, 21 years old when I had my daughter and I was 19, 20 when I had my uh, son. So with all those things, I try to not quit because I always believe for a woman being uh, independent financially is so important that is more Im important than anything in the world if we don't want to be like hostages or we want to be free we want to do the things on our way or we want to be recognized as human as equal or we have the power or equal rights we have to do something for ourselves we have to earn money we have to uh, participate in uh, financial um, things sure. so i don't quit my job this this was the journey uh, before human rights commission i was thinking about equality about gender equality about uh, femini feminism and all those concepts but with human rights commission i became more aware with seeing all those women how they were suffering because of this um patriarchal system that was going on in afghanistan with we had a democrat so-called democratic country we had um, equal law for the men and women, but in practice, there was nothing, nothing at all. I was seeing the women during the day, like 10 women, 12 women, 30 women who were beaten by their husbands, by their father, by their brother, by by anyone. They were raped. They were forced to marriage. They were like, that was quite a hill. I couldn't believe what I was saying. The women were coming with broken hands with broken feet with broken head and I was saying why I always I was questioning why and for what and then I realized it's only the mother of the power this is 
because the, the men, they have power and the women, they don't have. So this is how they apply all this pressure on the women. This is how I really became feminist. <laughs> this is how I became more aware and I wanted to do more things for the women or for the equality or humanity. So I worked three years, uh, first of the first three years with this uh, women's rights department on Human Rights Commission. And then dealing with all those violence cases for me was, I couldn't bear anymore. Uh, I was suffering every day, every day. And the only thing I could do was to following up those cases, to go to the court, to go to the attorneys and everywhere. But that was solving only one, two or three, or let's say like 100 cases. It couldn't change things deeply. So I decided to work with uh, Education Rights Unit with Human Rights Commission. And then uh, I applied for this job and uh, I was accepted. I passed these interviews and ex things, so I was accepted. And then um, I started to work with this section and I was going to around the country and I was traveling to different uh, provinces to educate the, the people with human rights uh, values. Uh, the um, equality, the gender equality, the um, all those human rights um, um, values to police, to the judges, to the media creators, to the uh, students of school, to the women, not only women, men and women, yeah. to because we cannot change the world without men or only we yeah. cannot educate the women. We need both of them. I worked until uh, Afghanistan collapsed by the hand of the Taliban. With human rights commission but during this time i was always um, also connected with the media because i started my first work at a, a local radio as a um, volunteer um, so when i was teenager and then i started work with this um, tv chain so this is how i was always connected to the media all law and media always. So uh, while working with Human Rights Commission, I was writing for different uh, press, um, but not with my own name, sometimes with my own name, but sometimes with the very sensitive um, stories or testimonies I was writing in, with a synonym. Uh, so yeah, this is how I keep writing and I started to write. Um, and this is also for me a good experience, which the time was not good experience, but now when I go back and when I think about this journey, uh, while I had my both of my children and I had to do the some stuff at work at home and I went to work during the day, when it was late night, everyone was asleep. I'll, I always emphasize in having a room of your own for the women because I had not that room of my own. We had I was living with my ex-husband's family because it's so normal in Afghanistan. And then while you know both of the children were sleeping, my ex-husband or everyone, I was going to the other room, which is called like we have a room for the guests in Afghanistan. Always, I was going there with a very um, low um, light. Uh, I was writing the stories and I was pitching those things and I was noting them with myself or writing for the other media. That is how I start writing, and. At the time, I didn't consider myself as a writer because there was just only, I was thinking, I'm writing stories. I'm writing about the women. I want to do something for the women. I want to show to the society what is going on in this city, in this country, while we are sleeping and we don't know. So um, I uh, started to write these stories. But when I left Afghanistan and I came to Paris, uh, this a very famous French um, newspaper, Korea International, which they cover the international um, international uh, issues. They, I had um, uh, a friend there. She uh, talked to you know, her colleagues and she talked how I was writing in Afghanistan with the media. So they offered me to write a, write a column for them. And wow. uh, yeah, it was a column for five with five stories, which was published for um, two months. And then I said, OK, but I cannot write in French. So they offered to translate it. And then I wrote in Farsi and then they translated to into French and they published these stories. And I was uh, quite shocked but by that because I was receiving emails, message on Twitter, Facebook, everywhere from different people and categ different categories uh, to 
and they were appreciating this column and they uh, they wanted to read this. Uh, so on that time I was thinking, okay, well now it's the time to believe more on myself, on my writing skills. And um, because before that I was, for my office formally, I was writing the reports, the formal reports, administratives and things. Um, but this time I was, uh, I accepted this. Okay, I have this skill as well. And yeah. I started writing. As soon as um, uh, this, uh, the women who write, wrote the preface for my book, I am so, she read these stories also in Korean International and she said, okay, we can find the publisher for you, for your book, because it was my dream. I wanted to write this book always since I started to writing this uh, notes or this uh, stories for the press because I was thinking that with myself but when I once I well I wrote this story on the book I don't want to spoil this when I uh, told to my ex-husband he just like mocked at me and said okay you're you think so and then I thought okay maybe maybe he is right always like manipulation works like this they think yeah. it, it make you to believe you can't do anything. You're nothing. You were no nothing. So that was the um, feeling I had the time. So I didn't uh, say that loudly again until I came to Paris. And here we find um, this very nice woman. Um, I am so she find this publishing house for me, um, La Maison Observatoire. And they asked me to write for them some examples to see what I'm writing. I sent them two, three examples and they were shocked and also they were surprised. They were excited for these stories. So, and they suddenly just, they sent me the contract to sign for the book. Uh, and this is how we started to write the book together. Amazing. A really, really amazing story. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Are you close to your family and, and, and where are your family right now? And what influence have they had on you? <laughs> it is a very hard question because after the Taliban, it's not only a country collapsed, all of our individual life also collapsed. Like if we think for families, each families were broken to pieces and as the country, the system, everything collapsed. For example, my family right now, I have a big family, a very traditional and big family, like mm. the other families in Afghanistan and Actually, we are coming from the north of the country and we have a lot of sisters and siblings. So right now I have a sister in Istanbul. I have a sister in UK. I have a brother in United States. I have siblings in wow. Germany, like everywhere yeah. around the world. I can say we have an embassy. Yeah. We have embassies. <laughs> everywhere. So yeah, my family is broken to pieces right now. They are everywhere suddenly. Uh, and my parents are alone in Afghanistan. And also my children, they're back in the country. Well, that's what it is. But I have some uh, siblings here in Europe. I can visit them time to time. And they came recently, actually. They were stuck in in, the, in Pakistan and in Iran, like, other pe like the other Afghanistan people right now who are there. And they suffer, suffer from this uh, long and um, long and then stop process. So right now, some of them are close to me in Germany. Yeah. But um, my family, they are, for example, my parents, there is some paradox. Um, my father is very well educated, open-minded. My mother are nice. They can understand me, but still they are under influence of the country, the situation. Sure. Um, still, for example, my father is a man and uh, they grew up and they he's now older and in on that country on that system and my mother as well so they're so proud of my book what i'm doing everything i have done uh they supported me for for my divorce which is a very hard and huge thing in afghanistan so okay. but they supported me they helped me right. through this process even though they were not agreed for for a while but right now they're asking me to wear my scarf which i don't like they accept this, but they always mention this. Uh, okay, everything you're doing is great, but if you're if you wear your scarf, it would be better. They always mention this. Uh, so, but I know this is the gap of uh, culture at uh, the sense of 
understanding and the generation. So sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're dealing with this. But um, I receive quite good messages from my father. He always talks about my handwriting in Farsi. And um, yeah, he's so proud of that. Everybody, everybody has some issues with their parents, I think. <laughs> well, this isn't for for now. This isn't issue because they accepted a lot. They have changed a lot, and for them, as traditional and very religious people, this was quite a lot. This change, yeah. all these yeah. things that I brought to them, it was quite a lot. Of course, yeah. So, do do you speak to your children regularly? If you don't mind me asking. Um, no, for sure it's okay. I I talk to them. I try to talk to them every day, but sometimes as they're children and they are playing, they are not interested. Sometimes they want to talk. Sometimes more. Um, but I tr we try to keep this contact forever, or as we can, as as possible as we can do this. We try yeah. to talk uh, through WhatsApp every day and yeah. to see each. Well, now they are more, they grow up more and fast, but still when I dream, I saw, I see them as the age I left Afghanistan. My son was five and my daughter was three. Whenever I dream uh, about them, I saw them, they're small and they're five and three, but when I talk to them now, they're they grew up so fast. Do you hope that they will leave Afghanistan one day and be with you, or you don't know? I really don't know. Uh, leaving Afghanistan for them is under a very hard circumstances. Well, mm. I'm not so hopeful for that. Um, I'm disappointed somehow, but somehow maybe maybe I am more hopeful of <laughs> um, a free country from the Taliban. Sure. I, yeah. I, I think need... that's more, I think that's more possible than this. Right. right. Okay. And I I should explain to the audience that all of these um terrible experiences you were describing that that the women went through that you encountered, this wasn't during the reign of the Taliban. This was before the Taliban came back to power. Right. This was um because the Taliban were in power before two thousand and one, wasn't it? And then again in twenty twenty one. But the period you were talking about was actually the yeah the 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 so-called democratic government did you say it was yeah exactly yes this is what i wrote on a, a book as well i wrote this is i started my work uh, with human rights commission on 2016 or 17 and i left afghanistan on 2021 i'm for me why these stories are important because i really want to emphasize on this part uh, for international community all those horrible stories happened in Afghanistan under a so-called democratic country when all these international community were there, United Nations was there, Human yeah. Rights Commission was there, all other institutes or organizations to help and support the women in a free country under the, like, as I said before, equal law and the best law in the region. Like, uh, if we... Um, I compare it to Iran, to Pakistan or India, we had good law or equal law for the women at least and the men. But all those things were happening there. Just then I emphasize this on all of my interviews. What do you think? What is happening right now? Right now there is nothing. There is only the Taliban, only their power and only um, like the women are in the hand of a terrorist group. This yeah. is why we are this um, gender apartheid and we are trying to recognize this as a gender apartheid because yeah it is these things happened before the Taliban just imagine right now what is happening there yeah of course of course I've never been to Afghanistan I've, I've seen some really beautiful pictures of the landscape um, it's obviously a very mountainous country um, I was hoping to get a sense of grounding because you know often often when we talk about all of these kinds of experiences it's it's a shame and and people can start to think that it's uh it's a bad place but it's not a bad place it's just that there are certain people making it bad or whatever so i, I wonder if you could describe something nice about afghanistan in particular the the natural landscape or the nature and maybe can you remember some kind of nice experience 
um, in the natural uh, setting of Afghanistan? Yeah, yes, of course. It is a very beautiful country, really beautiful country with kind people. They're warm people, welcoming people. They they welcome people a lot. They love people. They love each other. I think all those things is happening. It's because of this nonstop war, which is happening like more than 40 years, 45, 50 years. But the people, the local people, they're really nice. I always... Sometimes I wake up with missing my homeland, with missing Bamiyan, which is uh, this Bamiyan province. Maybe you know and the audience know about the big Buddhas there, which the Taliban exploded. Oh, right. Yeah. They came. The um, silence, the um, peacefulness, everything you feel there, I think. Since I am in Europe, I traveled a lot around and I was a lot in a lot of places, nice places, natural places. But the peace that you feel in Bamiyan, you will not feel that anywhere else. This is all the mountains, the, the different color of the, um, the mountains. That is something quite different or when I remember the last time I was in Konar, which is in the west of the country, that is something else. The, mm, the beauty, like each each province is different than the other province. The color of the mountains, the color of the trees, the river. We don't have a sea, but the river, like, or if you, I don't know if anyone goes to my Instagram, I have the stories of uh, different um, uh, provinces, which I have been uh, during my work or at, uh, or I have a picture on my um, uh, LinkedIn cover which is in Badakhshan and Kokcha River I was there right um, one month before the Taliban and really you can feel this peace and this beauty and this smell and those love from even from the pictures that is quite different Maybe I feel this way because this is my homeland, this is my country, but I believe anyone who went to Afghanistan, they are fall in love with the Bamiyan, they are fall in love with Badakhshan, with the beauty of the Badakhshani girls, they're so famous for their beauty. Or um, I think this is quite a beautiful country. If we have peace there one day, if we can go to um if we can go to Nuristan. Anyone who thinks about Nuristan, they became excited. This that is a very beautiful and pure nature uh, province in Afghanistan. That's great. That's really great. Thank you. In your recent interview for France Twenty Four, it was mentioned that you are currently working on some fiction, um, but I think there wasn't time in that interview to go any further. But can you explain what is this fiction that you are working on? Yeah. Uh, well, I don't want to spoil it. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, um, well, as I have been always multitasker, that is something I sometimes I'm not so comfortable with it because I I need to do things, a lot of things. Yeah. I'm currently I'm working for Afghanistan inter Afghanistan International Radio as a producer and presenter, which I produce um programs on human rights and women rights in Afghanistan and the situation and I do the news also. I present the news and also um, I'm advocating for women rights all around and I'm talking about this and also I'm signing this book and talking about like many things together. But right now I'm working on this fiction stories, which is a collection of fiction stories. I love it um, because for the first book, the, all the women are the victims of violence. Some somehow somehow I see them as heroes. I wrote that on the book that it is true. I'm I'm impressed by Simone de Beauvoir, or I'm impressed by Virginia Woolf, or, or um, uh, Simone V in French in France, which is very famous, and I appreciate them. But still, I'm impressed more by these women who are coming and asking for support. They're asking for help. Let's imagine they're uneducated, most of them but they know how to ask for help or how to protect themselves and know their inequality. So I'm in this second book, I'm trying to, to represent or to introduce the very famous, um, the, the poets that were in Afghanistan, but we never knew about them. We knew their brothers, we knew their families, but we don't hear about them. 
So I'm trying to uh, work on these heroes, on, Afghan on the, the women in Afghanistan who are really heroes, who I'm inspired by them. And, but I would do this by in a faction story and I will bring many women from different generations together. Maybe in one table, they will have on a table a coffee together, maybe from Afghanistan in Paris, or we don't know where, somewhere uh, in this planet. This is one thing I'm working um, on it. And the other thing that I started that since I'm in France. Uh, well, I started this actually when I was in Afghanistan and traveling around and I couldn't see my children. But since I'm in France and in Paris, I'm writing letters to them. I'm writing letters for my children, but I never send them because they cannot read it. Wow. And also it's not the time for them to read those things. But we know we will, all of us, we will be one day judged by our beloved ones. And for my children, maybe they will also have this feeling one day. And yeah, right now I'm writing these letters and also I'm thinking about publishing this. Wow, that's amazing. That's really amazing. Um, I'd, re I'd really look forward to reading the stories in, in particular. When do, you think, when do you think your collection of stories will be ready to read for the public? <laughs> well, um, as I don't have a deadline, <laughs> Like I had for my book, it might take a while. <laughs> That's okay. So you mentioned you are still involved in some human rights work, um, including on an international radio station. Can can you explain more about that? And how does that link to women who are still in Afghanistan? Do, do you have much contact with women who are in Afghanistan or anyone who who is in Afghanistan at the moment? Well, um, first of all, when I was in Afghanistan and working with Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission, that was my job. There was not something activism. Yeah. That was a job that I was doing, uh, going to educating the the people or to making advocacy or changing the law or bring the more emphasis on women rights and the violences in Afghanistan and revising or um, monitoring the laws that was, uh, were issuing in Afghanistan. That was my job, like like a job that I had sure, to do. Sure, sure, sure. But uh, since I'm in Europe, I, I made this not as a job, but as a responsibility, like something I'm not paid for. But I think I have to do this for the women, for the equality, for the women who are back in the country and they can do anything. The women, the Afghanistan women, the protesters, they went to the roads and they protested against the Taliban. And I was thinking, why should I stay here calm and comfortable and not doing something? So this is how I became activist. My act, like my job changed to activism because I know the conventions, I know the human rights, I know the women rights. So uh, this is how now I'm speaking around about Afghanistan and women and the situation in different pla different platforms in European Parliament, I spoke in European Parliament, as you may saw, or different um, conferences in different countries. Um, so that is what I am talking about, and also um, uh, how my my current job uh, depends to human rights. Um, I'm working for Afghanistan International um, Network, which is a network based in UK. We have this Afghanistan International and Iran International uh, media. Uh, so in Afghanistan International, we have a TV, we have a website, uh, digital uh, media, and also we have this radio station. I'm working for the radio station. And uh, yes, still I'm connected to my friends, to my families, to, to different people in Afghanistan. They, they found us any way they um, can, because right now in Afghanistan, people are trying to do something for themselves. So they contact us as well. We have these phone numbers, particular phone numbers on our website and Facebook and social media. So right. they can contact us and they send us videos, they send us articles, videos, anything. And uh, for this radio, yes, we are trying to cover uh, the things that is not being covered by the media in Afghanistan right now. The media are hardly censored in Afghanistan and they're under the, these censors and the journalists are being arrested by the Taliban and um, anyone who are who wants to speak against the um, uh, regime or if they think they will talk about the regime sometimes against the regime, they arrest them and put them in jail. So 
we feel this as a responsibility to be uh, to echo the voice of those people back in the country. Um, this is how I contact with the women. They contact with me. They share their issues. Their the thing that's important for them to be published, and we uh, do interviews with them online. Then we have to change their voices. We have to change their name. We we have to protect them as well and uh, to not be recognized by the regime. Okay, great, great. That's really great work. Okay. Um, next question. How should the international community help the women of Afghanistan, in your view? Um, I'm talking about, I guess, governments, but, but also just, you know, normal people like me, citizens, activists, how 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 should people help the women of Afghanistan? Uh, well, currently the all the world the world is messed up. Uh, everywhere we saw this war. First, while well, this um, thing happened in Afghanistan, first of all, the world pay was trying to pay attention a little bit, but they wanted to just whitewash themselves with uh, this evacuation process. And they think, mm. okay, we did our responsibility, which was not the only responsibility they had with all those weapons they left for the Taliban there back right. in the country. Um, so, uh, but after that, with the Ukraine crisis and with the Iran uh, revolution of the women and also with this um, Gaza crisis, of course, people... Which is horrible. I I accept this is horrible and horrible. There can be nothing horrible than that. So, but still, um, all the world forgot about the women in Afghanistan. They're forgetting that the Hibatullah, the leader of the Taliban, a few days ago, he said, "We know this is against your democracy, but we will stone the women tomorrow." He said this to uh, the Western countries. And today they also emphasize on stoning and also to the punishments, the cruel punishments, the, those things in Afghanistan. And they are doing this every day and every day. And the world is not taking and thinking about this. I think it's only for the governments, it's only their interest. The thing that they change, the, um, they will not change anything if there isn't their own interest. But as individuals, we can change something. We can support people. If we know there are people who need support, if we can, for example, provide a visa, scholarship, online courses, any kind of support for the women in Afghanistan, we should um, support them. We should not abandon them. We should not just forgot them simply. Talking about them is uh, important as um, citizens of different countries to put pressures on our, on your countries, like you're paying taxes for those countries, you're working for them, you're the citizen, you have to question their decisions. For example, United Nations, they have an election before, so they can vote for the people they know they are doing good things for the world. And they have to use their vote, their vote for, for good, not just being not taking responsibility or not taking about our uh, country's politics. I think all these things for the individuals, they, that will make change. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, simple question. I think you kind of already answered this, but do, do you hope to return to Afghanistan one day? And I guess you would you would return to Afghanistan if if the Taliban were, were no longer in power, right? Is that true? Yes. <laughs> yes true yeah. well sometimes i'm disappointed really to going back to the country or after everything they have done to the country they they really destroyed the country all the system that was built in the past 20 years in the past 20 years they exploded the roads the schools the hospitals they killed the students inside the universities they killed the civilians in the hospitals the children that were supposed to be born their mothers all of them they just killed them and they are not responsible for that today and today when they came to the power they just still they're killing the people the starveness in afghanistan like the healthcare system has been collapsed the women are not going to school just Imagine a country that in five years, in 10 years, there isn't any educated women. So this is a crisis. This is catastrophe. This is huge. We cannot explain this in words. So I think with all those things, 
if they continue to stay, I'm hopeless. I will not go back. Definitely, I no. will not live under an apartheid regime. I will not no. live under a regime like that for nothing. For nothing, like no. nothing will change it, this this decision. Not even leaving my family behind or anything else. It will not be changed one day. But yes, maybe the the day that Afghanistan is free, maybe I will return tomorrow to to be back on my country, to work back and to to do something for all the mess I've been have done to do yeah. my responsibility. I would love to go and do something. But right now I feel home here as well. Maybe after I will, a while, I will have two homes. I will think for both countries. Sure. To finish off with, I just wanted to ask you a really lighthearted question uh, to finish with. So from your YouTube channel, I can see that you like cooking. You have this video where you're cooking, I think maybe with a friend or something, you're cooking a, a massive meal. So can you describe one of your favorite dishes from Afghanistan? Uh, well, when we are feminists or activists or independent independent women, society thinks or imagine we shouldn't cook or we can't cook or yes, the feminists shouldn't have family. They don't like children. They don't want to have children or they are against the marriage or against the family institutes. But this is not true. Yes, as a feminist, I can cook and I'm... I cook well. I love for a while I hated it because I was forced to cook. But mm. now I love to cook for my friends, for my family, when I invite all of them. You might see on YouTube what I have done was half mewa. That is something for we do that for Nowruz. Nowruz is the first day of the spring. Right. In Afghanistan or Persian region, we um celebrated as new year eve that is for us new year so this is something very traditional very old um custom so i love to keep that as a person as a someone who speaks farsi who are related to this culture i love to keep that that is hafniwa which we we make that but my favorite dish um i can cook anything yeah. <laughs> um, of course, the local food, but maybe bulani. I could say bulani. What is that? Can you can you describe what what are the it's ingredients? Hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> it can be with anything, with potatoes, with vegetables, with. Um, sometimes people can make that with. Um, well, with anything you want. <laughs> so and then to. To rule it and then put vegetables and pride and oil um yeah it's been really fantastic to talk to you today thank you so much um and i will i will spread this video as far as possible i'll put all of your links underneath and i hope that in the future um when when i have grown my channel and i have made my channel a lot bigger maybe i can talk to you again when when my channel is bigger in 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 one year or in two years or something what do you think i would love to i know thank right. you so much You're doing great i liked uh, the content you were making and thank you. i i really enjoyed today as well right <laughs> i see we continued a lot yeah fantastic um, it was so nice to meet you and to make this video cool. thank you so right. much no problem no problem